to a little bit of that material and I'll deglove myself from the tablet here. Okay, um, great. So, um, material from the Topos polynomial functors course lectures 4.5 and 6.5, these the special lectures by David Jazz Myers, I see as some of the most interesting material in that course overall and, and to that point, um, because it focuses on some key uses for polynomial functors when representing dynamical systems. Um, and uh, particularly their use as a tool for reasoning about the behavior of those systems uh, and for reasoning about mappings between systems and the impacts of those mappings on behaviors, uh, for example. Um, or the capacity to identify uh, rigorously the uh, what a particular behavior means for a specific uh, dynamical system, or uh, the ways in which uh, one system might approximate another, uh, or might characterize another, but in a reduced form, um, might emulate another, or as David says, simulate another. Um, and as a system scientist, you know, these things uh, struck me as um, of great relevance to my interest in, in category three. Um, so we're talking here, uh, and I'm gonna switch over to my slides, uh, of course, about uh, these two lectures um, by David Jazz Myers and his supporting uh, book, which I, I consider a rather nice, um, nice addition um, uh, in this area. Very, very important. So, you know, we've been talking about how polynomial functors allow us to specify dynamical systems in a ways that has, in ways that have all these desiderata. Um, and uh, different, um, coverage in different lectures to this point has focused on uh, elements, uh, different elements from this list. Um, we saw modularity with the ability to, to tensor up, you know, um, the expression of subsystems into expression of entire systems or to take the products and, and, and to even use co-product to reason about added modes of systems. Um, uh, we, we saw the last two times the use of wiring diagrams to, to offer this sort of declarative, transparent and, and, and quite visual depiction of these systems, one that's rigorous enough you can reason about it. Um, and, uh, and a little bit about composability. Here though, we're, we're gonna be talking about three of these points, you know, transformability, um, is sort of capacity to safely map one system to another where safe is it, it preserves the sort of the visible properties of that system simply reduces its uh, state space, for example, in a consistent fashion. Supportive of analytical reasoning. Um, for example, the steady states combined via matrix arithmetic and in general behavioral modes will will combine in, in structured ways from subsystems um, to, to the behavior of the entire system. And it's elegant. Um, and you will have seen at least a glimpse of how you can specify these patterns representing behavioral modes to allow you to, and to reason about associated behaviors for the entire system. Um, there's way too much material for us to, to cover here in the next 15 minutes. Um, uh, appropriately, uh, I'll just say that, um, you know, for dynamical systems, uh, these lectures showed that beyond the generalized lens maps um, that we've been working with and which were illustrated here in, in their monomial form um, for that exercise, uh, there's, um, in addition, um, 
a, a, a further type of morphism between polynomials. And, and that comes in the form of these charts. And these charts play a really valuable role uh, in achieving some of these desiderata. So um, they allow us to reason about this coarse graining of systems or approximation of systems, um, having reduced systems um, that have uh, preserved observable behavior, but also for identifying behavioral modes. Um, and there's this construct, which we haven't talked about and which I would have loved to have gotten to, um, of double categories, where we have two types of morphisms. We have these, um, um, these morphisms corresponding to charts, which David shows as the horizontal ones. And then we have these ones for the lens maps, um, which are the vertical ones. And there are these commuting squares that relate them to one another. Um, this isn't the first time we've mentioned such a construct. I, I muttered about it at one point when talking about a category where functors are objects and the morphisms are, are, are natural transformations because we have horizontal and vertical composition of natural transformations and a similar construct comes in. But in this double category, it relates to dynamical systems in a way that's close to home to me as a system scientist. Um, and uh, David introduces the fact that maps between systems are associated with these commuting squares, where kind of on the left side of it, we have this mapping from SY to the S to P, one system and the right side represents the other system. Um, and there needs to be certain invariants maintained that are expressed by the commuting conditions, the two commuting conditions. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll talk about it, but um, basically it has to do with um, preserving this behavior. So here's one system and here's another system. And out of this comes certain relationships between these two systems that need to be maintained for this to be a safe, uh, characterization, a reduced scale characterization of this one. Um, uh, now, moreover, within this context, our archetype systems are used to represent behavioral patterns. And these maps between systems when applied to these archetypes will establish the conditions for those patterns to apply. Um, just as these maps specified the conditions for which one system safely approximates or, or, or characterizes in a simplified way in another. When one of these is one of these behavioral patterns and, and it specifies the conditions under which that applies, um, when one of these is this archetypical patterns, uh, this, these relations that need to be maintained will specify kind of the situations in which these behavioral patterns will apply. Um, and uh, these representative systems come in many forms. David, uh, during what we uh, saw, we or during the, those videos, we saw uh, essentially two of these. One was a fixed point, one was kind of the time behavior of a system, the trajectories associated with a system over time. But there's other ones like, uh, like this cycle or more ad hoc ones that you could define that would let you reason about when, when these situations obtain, kind of automatically identify the conditions under which they obtain. Um, and using that mechanism, David did define these trajectories. Um, and uh, he showed that um, in, in lecture 6.5, uh, a glimpse of the fact of how um, these, uh, these uses of these commuting squares uh, allow for reasoning about how the subsystem behaviors, the behaviors of subsystems translate into behaviors for a system as a whole. It also allows us to reason about how, as we say, collapse the system, we coarse grain it, 
we take a system that's finer grained, we characterize it at a coarser level. In his example, a counter is approximated by a flip-flop in as far as um, we're just observing its mod two behavior. We can reason about how behaviors translate. Um, things like the steady state or the time behavior or the, um, uh, the oscillatory behavior or what have you. Um, so those are some important themes. Just to, um, and again, conscious of the fact that we have to brutally uh, observe time here. Um, uh, I'll just note that we have these two types of maps. The ones we've been dealing with are lens maps. And I, I you know, we've, we've just seen this, uh, this exercise uh, where we talked about these, but you know, here we have two maps from one. So this is a map between polynomials, P to Q, and um, uh, David Jess Myers draws it with an arrow going right and an arrow going left, reflecting the fact that one of the relationships from these polynomials goes from P to Q. That's the map the identification of indices. So uh, for a given index in P or a given position in P, we find a position in Q. Um, Q is, P is the sum of, of these uh, different representables, uh, each of the form Y to some exponent. And from one of those we map in P, we map to one of them in Q. And then, we have a mapping in the reverse direction from the exponent associated with the one to which we map back to the exponent associated with whence it came, the, the, the source position over here. We've seen this in enough times together. I don't think I have to dwell on this, but it's worth no emphasizing that this second mapping goes backwards from Q to P, because we'll see soon we'll see for the other type of mapping between polynomials that it's the reverse. Um, instead of going Q to P, we'll go P to Q. And it turns out these maps can be expressed as one of these constructs I didn't have time to talk about, a, what's called a coalgebra. And unfortunately, this is something I'm going to have to go light on here, but um, I would love to talk about it. Uh, Coalgebras um, and algebras are probably the single biggest topic I wish we had gotten to uh, in this course. Um, uh, but essentially, the functions associated with this lens map um, uh, can be seen as captured in a uh, this thing called a coalgebra between S and P of S, where P is this functor. We're simply substituting in. If, if S is a set, as it is with our cases, where we just substitute S into the P, we have polynomial of this set. It's a disjoint union summing up this set, um, uh, various exponents mapping into this uh, set. Um, so we have a sum on, say, of, of you know, um, S to the to the two and, and uh, s to the one and, and uh, s to the three, et cetera. Um, and it turns out that can be expressed as a set of pairs. It's a disjoint union. It's a tagged union. So um, uh, we, can, we can express that, this disjoint union of these different terms as a sum of pairs, a, a set of pairs. And uh, if we take advantage of the fact that a mapping into from S into a set of pairs is the same as a pair of mappings um, into each of those components, we can recognize that each of these functions corresponds directly to the functions in the lens map of which we have just been discussing. One is the readout function and one is the update function if P is a monomial. Um, um, otherwise, one is, is phi of one and the other is phi sub i. Um, these reduce to, re to readout and, uh, and to uh, this update when, when Q is a, uh, is a monomial. Um, P and Q are monomials. OK. Um, so it turns out you can express these as, as 
coalgebras. And uh, that turns out to be quite useful for reasoning about um, the rules by which um, charts uh, interact with, with uh, lens maps. But David introduces this construct of a chart, which is this mapping like lens maps, um, it's generalized lens maps that map between from P to Q. Um, this is another type of mapping from P to Q. Uh, and it's shown here. And it's written with, instead of with these kind of back and forth notation with where you know one goes forward and one goes backward, it's written instead where both go forward. And um, here we, we have something very similar for one of them. It, it has just the right, the same feels for the lens map. We map positions at P to positions at Q. But this phi flat, this guy here, um, looks familiar, but at the same time, it looks different. Um, strange yet familiar. Um, so here uh, with the lens map, we had something here from Q to P. It came back from Q, where this thing mapped to Q and mapped back to the, the index from which it had come in P. Uh, here we have to reverse. It goes from P to Q. Um, mm. uh, so it's, it's, it's reverse. And this is why they're shown going both going this way. Uh, and it turns out that these lens maps um, uh, interact with these charts in some fixed way. Charts will be used for certain types of mappings. Here, foundationally, what we have is uh, when it's applied to dynamical systems, like these monomials, we have a mapping from S to T. We're, we're sort of with phi, it's kind of saying for each S, where did, what T state does it go to? You can imagine taking a counters potential and mapping it down to just, you know, even or odd uh, here. Um, all these natural numbers to even or odd, uh, for example. And, uh, and that's the job of, of kind of this, this phi, okay? And, and then phi flat handles it for the, the appropriate exponents. Um, so when we have a map between dynamical systems, going, going from just general polynomials to these dynamical systems, particularly these monomial systems shown here, um, this is one system on the left, and this is another system on the right. And we have this mapping here that tells us for each S, you know, what T we're going to use. And so it can be very useful for coarse graining S, for saying for each S, where does it go with, uh, um, in terms of a T. Okay. Um, uh, so we'd like to know kind of uh, what, conditions need to apply for this to be safe. For this system, maybe it's just a smaller scale system, a flip-flop rather than a counter, it's safe to use this to approximate this or to characterize this, to emulate this, but in a simpler way, um, in a reduced scale sort of way, re reduced order sort of way. Um, so these connections are charts. Um, so a chart, and this is a particularly trivial one with just equality. Here we have the same P, the same uh, identical uh, interface. And we're trying to reason where is it safe? Well, um, here, if you go through the commuting conditions um, and uh, you, you go through them kind of like, uh, one going this way and the other going this way. Um, so, so going around with kind of the uh, the arrows uh, in a in a certain direction. Well, we need this to kind of commute with that along the top and and this one, and then we need another one to commute to these corners. And if we establish those commuting conditions, and it's a little bit tricky to reason about because you. You need to remember that like uh, a given map to thing I is associated with a set S from which it maps up here. 
but you can identify these commuting conditions. Um, and, uh, and David Riesel's uh, reasons about this as sort of uh, mapping between coalgebras. But um, at, at the end of the day, this coarse graining has to preserve observable behavior. So for dealing with the original system, we get a readout from a state, whatever that state maps to over in the other system, the simplified system has to give the same readout. And you know, for in a state uh, over here on the left in the full scale system, um, and we consider that that new state that that this can go to with a given input, um, you know, and we ask where does that map to over here uh, on the reduced scale system? That has to map to that to the same place as if we had instead coarse grain the starting state here, the, 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 that initial state or that, that state we were dealing with before the update. And then we updated in the reduced scale system, um, we should be getting that same state. So whether we, we, this should remind you of the naturality condition we deal with with natural transformations. If we have the state here and we update over here in this system and then map it, then do the reduced order, the order reduction. Or if we first do the order reduction and then perform this step over in the reduced scale system, we should get the same condition. It's, it's very much this flavor of the naturality square that we dealt with with, with natural transformations um, going between say a list and a maybe, uh, maybe functors. Um, so, um, we saw this uh, in the video for this uh, counter and a flip-flop and, uh, and where the coarse graining is simply you know, associated with uh, mapping, it, mapping it down. So we're just keeping track of the, whether it's even or odd essentially. Uh, and here where readout um, uh, for, for both, uh, is associated with a modulo, uh, mod two. Uh, and this coarse graining um, uh, here uh, can be done in a way that's consistent, um, where the behavior of this counter is indistinguishable if we're just looking at mod two behavior from the behavior of the flip-flop that results because we've maintained the observable behavior and the update behavior um, for this. Uh, and there was another example with a finite state diagram where an original finite state diagram was reduced to a simplified one um, in a way that's coarse grained, but in a consistent fashion, not willy nilly, but in a fashion that, that is guaranteed to preserve the, the behavior. And so this state, given that it outputs A and this one outputs A and this, sort of circles around like that, not circles around like that. Um, we can collapse these two together and we can collapse these two together. Um, even though they are different states and this is led to by a blue, for example, we could collapse them into one state. And I don't have time to go into that, but it's a, as long as we maintain these conditions, uh, it's a safe operation. And so this provides us a way of taking a more Fancy system and coarse graining it. The final thing which David talked about in lecture 6.5 is the ways we can represent behaviors using these archetypical systems. Um, and you see them here. And these archetypical systems can be defined for different types of behaviors. Each has a system archetype associated with it. Um, David talks in the, in the lecture 6.5 on, on the, the one representing fixed points or steady states of a system and the rep one representing time. But we can have other ones as well, like, like for uh, cycles, for oscillations. Um, and the really neat thing here is that just as we have this, these uh, commuting squares here in general for reasonable coarse graining, if we take this left-hand side to be an archetypical system, and so one of these squares in general for these dynamical systems like this, you know, will give us the conditions under which this one safely approximates that one. 
when, when the left-hand side here is an archetype, what this gives us is the conditions under which this behavior represented by this archetype behaves um, or, or obtains and when it applies. Um, so if we have, for example, the steady state, we, this is the kind of archetypical archetype for steady state behavior. It's a single state, which has a single input that cycles round to itself. So it can be mapped as shown as this lens map between one y to the one. There's only one state here with one input mapping to itself. Um, and you know, with any input with this fixed input, it goes back to itself, to its single state. So there's only one state um, here. We have that system on the left here, and we have any monomial system on the on the right here, as, as expressible by wiring diagram, for example, here with if this were if P were a monomial as well, but more generally than that, if P is not, this a dynamical system on the right. Um, if we establish, if we look at these conditions for this commuting of this square, then what we get is the conditions under which it's in a steady state. And it's, it's basically well, undertaken by reasoning about these double commuting conditions, going back here, going this way, and then uh, from this upper left corner as well. Um, it's, as I say, it requires a little bit of, of finesse here because, um, uh, because of, uh, the nature of some of these mappings when you trace through this behavior. But here, you notice this gives us the conditions under which a steady state applies, under which it obtains. Um, and similarly, when we have the archetypical system being time, we, we can identify the conditions under which time applies, which kind of gives us the trajectories of the the, the system. Um, and it turns out this ar archetypical system can be presented this way, where n is kind of the time quantum or tick associated with this, uh, this system. Um, and so that allows us to identify kind of the trajectories associated with the system, a trajectory of, of outputs, and of underlying states uh, associated with this system um, that, that obtain. Um, OK, um, I'm basically out of time. And, and um, I'll just note that by virtue of this, um, um, by virtue of being able to articulate this double category, we can start to secure advantages. One of them is. We can reason about when we coarse grain a system, how does the steady state change, or how does the um, how does the time behavior change, or or how does the oscillatory behavior change, etc. We could take these archetypes and more, and we can reason about how do they change as we map the state space as we change that. The other thing we can do is reason about how the behaviors of the subsystems relate to the behaviors of the whole. And one of the you know, more prominent results of this is by David Spivak, where he showed that when you have these dynamical systems, um, the behaviors for the whole relate to the behaviors uh, for the subtypes, well, for steady state behavior specifically, the steady states of the, subs of the subtypes um, relate by a form of kind of matrix arithmetic to the behaviors for the whole system. And in general, the behavior for the subsystems relate to behaviors of the whole systems in some structured ways. And David's, David Jasmeyer's book lays out that relationship in a more general way. Okay, um, that's all we have time for today. I do have a, um, uh, unfortunately, a meeting now that uh, to which I have to obtain. I have some slides on uh, that provide some um, thoughts on, on this course. 
what I'm going to do is record those separately um, and uh, I will post them. But uh, I want to thank you for bearing with this course. Um, thought we might have some significant attrition. Um, but I'm, I'm actually rather pleased by uh, what we've been able to explore in this course. In, that, in those um, thoughts, I comment on areas I wish we had been able to get to, things like uh, ends, co-ends, uh, algebras and co-algebras, um, uh, some, some material that we covered before in the discussion group though, as well as things like adjunctions and, um, and monads and monad algebras, uh, uh, which are, uh, are really uh, valuable and things like Galois connections, which are sort of practical sides of them, in that case, at junctions um, uh, of, of significance to us as computer scientists. But I also have some comments there about the significance of this material and system science, significance uh, in implementing systems in software engineering and, and more generally in, in, in building systems. Um, so I will record that video. I hope you find it uh, useful. And, um, you know, it's really been a tremendous uh, pleasure uh, and privilege to be able to go through this material with you. I appreciate your patience and trying to get through this, this crunchy exterior of category theory that's so difficult to initially penetrate to get to the soft, gooey interior um, of chocolatey goodness, which uh, hopefully you get a bit of a glimpse of with uh, today's coverage on dynamical systems, um, perhaps from earlier components as well. I'll look forward to working with you as well on your uh, course projects over the next few weeks um, as I uh, rest from uh, my uh, lectural exertions. So uh, thank you very much. And we're going to be continuing on in a discussion group form, I'm imagining, um, next semester with some components, but at a somewhat slower pace. Um, so thank you, everyone. Uh, and I'll let you know when I get a chance to post the reflections video um, uh, and, um, and comments on the course. Thanks greatly. Thank you. OK, take care there. Stay safe. Thank you. Okay.